It's a good question. We're, we're in Dafakhov Gimel Ahmed Aleph. And although we went a little bit further, we're going to go back the draw to begin uh, a section. It's Hafimul Ahmed Aleph, halfway down the page. Halim Hanigmarim Betahara. Vessels that were completed in a state of, of Tahara. So we said with regards to Kaidesh, they would require an immersion in the mikvah, whereas for Truma, they wouldn't. So that's where we're going to start from. Yep. That's where we're going to start from. And today, we're in for a ride. Um, <laughs> we're in for a ride. So, Okay, so what is it, 23A1 or 3? Where are two. we? 23A2. Okay, thank you. It's the sick case listed in the Mishnah in terms of the different stringencies that Kodesh has over Truma that the rabbis enacted. And um, so, yeah, that's what we're going to be discussing today. And we're going to get into a whole discussion about the Paraduma and the preparation of the ashes for the, for the red heifer. And um, yeah, it, it's, it's exciting. <laughs> let's, just <put> it, <laughs> let's just put it that way. Um, and uh, it, it's good to have your thinking cap on because we're going to have to follow, uh, follow the, the, the lines of argument that are presented over here. Um, you know, sometimes the Gemara will have a problem not because of something that is directly tied to it, but because of a particular outcome at the end, if you follow that line of reasoning. So the Gemara has to go all the way and follow the whole thing all the way through and say, aha, you see, but at the end, this is what's going to happen. And therefore, we've got to reject it all the way from the beginning. So we'll, we'll, we'll see how that uh, all plays out today. Okay, in 10 or 2, we're going to start. Kalim Hanigmarim Tahara, the Mishnah said, the vessels that were completed in the state of Tahara, which we know that when it comes to Kalim, they do not become vessels that are susceptible to Tuma until they are completed. So we say that even if the person who completed it was careful to complete it in a state of purity, nevertheless, when it comes to vessels that are going to be used for Kodesh, we make an extra stringency that you have to nonetheless immerse it in the mikvah. Not so for Tuma. So the Gemara asks, the Gamri Nanman, who's the person who's going to complete this vessel that we're going to require him to immerse it in the mikvah? If you're going to say, the Gamri Nanman, that the person who's completing it was a Chaver, now the Chaver is going to be careful. So Lama why were they why were they requiring immersion? Ella, so rather, are you going to say, the Gamri Nanman, that it was completed by an Amhoaretz, then Nigmarina Bitarek Karilahu, would the Tan of the Mishnah call that completing a vessel in the state of Tahara? If you have an Amhoaretz completing the vessel, then we can assume that it's not the Tahara, it's not going to be done in a state of purity. So, therefore, who is it that is completing this vessel that the Tana says it was done in a state of Tahara and nonetheless requires Tvila? And the Gemara, Amar Rabba Bashila, Amar Rabba Masna, Amar Rabba Shmuel. Le'olam de Gamrin Hukhave. Actually, it was actually completed by a Chaver. Now, why are we so concerned that we require immersing it into the mikvah? Mishum Tzinur Damares. It's on account of the possibility that maybe before he completed, maybe he invited an Amha Oretz to come and look at the vessel, and the Amha Oretz may have omitted some spittle that landed on the vessel, and that might have made it uh, pame, and therefore we require him to immerse it in the mikvah. But the Gemara says, one second, the Nafal Amos, when did this spittle of the Amha Oretz fall on the tail? If you're going to say that the spittle fell before he completed it, we just said it's not going to be a vessel until you completed making the vessel. So we're not really concerned if the spittle of Amoritz hits the vessel before it's completed. And we said that it was completed in a state of Tahara. So why are we worried about it? Allah. 
Bossa de Gamish. So maybe you're going to want to say that really it was that he spat on it or he spoke and some spittle came out and hit the Kaili after the Chavar finished it. But that doesn't make sense either. Why? Because Misa Zarbahu, the Chavar would, would certainly, the Chavar would certainly be careful when it comes to um, not allowing the Am or it's anywhere near a vessel that has been completed in a state of Tahara. So the Gemara comes along and he says, again, we're in the article 23, A2, towards the end of that page. Um, it's halfway down, just halfway, just past halfway down, uh, so the Gemara answers, actually, it was in the case where it was before it was completed. So now, now we understand why the Amoretz was even allowed anywhere near the vessel. But our concern is, we're worried that it's possible that the spit of the Amoretz might remain wet even after this vessel was completed and then it could convey and then it could convey tuma and onto this vessel and that's what we're worried about because as is explained elsewhere that when it with regards to con, um, conveying tuma spittle that has dried up does not convey any tuma it's only while it's still wet so what we're concerned about is the cover is showing his friend, the Amma Oretz, this vessel, and some spittle may have contact, come into contact with the vessel. Then the Amma Oretz leaves and the cover goes to complete make, making this vessel, but the spittle still remained a bit um, and it was still wet. And that's what we're concerned of. And this is, although it's a far-fetched concern, but with regards to Kodesh, we're that careful that even if you complete a vessel in Tahara, because we're worried about this, you'll have to immerse it into the mikvah. Okay, so now, from the fact that our Mishnah says that you have to immerse it in the mikvah, and doesn't say anything else with regards to any requirements that you need to be able to make this Tahar, it it seems that all it requires is an immersion into the mikvah, but not what is called Ha'arev Shemesh. Because in the Torah, there are different levels of Tuma and Tahara, which means if somebody is Tame, there's a process by which he becomes pure again. However, even going into the mikvah sometimes is not enough. Sometimes you need to wait until the person um, has you know, waited till the sun has gone down. And it's the sun that's going down that brings him the completion of his tahara. Others might have to even wait until the next morning when they bring when they bring the sacrifice. When they bring the sacrifice, that will then allow them to partake in things of Kodesh, for example. But from our Mishnah, it seems that with regards to this extra stringencies that the rabbis made when it came to Kodesh, that when you're completing to make a vessel in a state of purity. And because we're concerned that maybe an Amma Oritz came along and some spittle came on it. And it still remained there while it was completed. And therefore, we have to immerse it into the mikvah. The Mishnah doesn't tell us that it needs to wait till the Shemesh. Says the Gemara, Tefillah in, it will require the immersion into the mikvah, but Har Shemesh Loi, it doesn't require waiting until the nightfall. If that's the case, are we to say that this Mishnah could not go in and work with another Mishnah uh, where the author is, Rabbi, well, one of the opinions is Rabbi Eliezer. Now, before we go into the Mishnah, I want to share something with you because it's going to be easier to understand what's going on if we look at some of the Psukim first and also Allah in Rambam. So let us start with the Psukim. Okay, so let's start with the Psukim, if I can find it. Um, there you go. Okay. Can you see it? I hope you can see it. Okay. So it says over here, with regards to... Oh, my computer is too big over here. One second. There you go. Make it smaller. 
Okay, it says over here in the Pasuk, with regards to preparing the para aduma, that one of the things that they'll do is in verse 18, it says, the lokach ezoiv, the toval bamayim ishtahar. So we're talking about an ishtahar, a richly clean person who's going to come along and take the hyssop and dip it into the water and sprinkle it on the tent on all the vessels, and on the people who were in it, and on anyone who touched the bone, the slain person, the corpse, or the grave. Okay, so here in verse 18, it already states that this person who's going to be doing it is considered to be ritually pure. Yes, so far so good. Now in verse 19, it says, the hiza hatar alatome, the richly clean person, shall sprinkle on the unclean person on the third day, and on the seventh day, and he shall cleanse him on the seventh day, and he shall wash his clothes and bathe in water, and he shall become richly clean in the evening. Now, with regards to who, which koye is allowed to come along and take the contents and sprinkle the other, uh, this person who's impure, the Pusik twice says a richly clean person, right? It's the first time it says Ishtar, and the second time it says again Hatar. So the rabbis came along and they said, this supports a halacha that we have, the Kabbalah from Moshe, from Har Sinai, that when it comes to the process of a chatas, a meaning the para aduma, the efra chatas, the efra of the para aduma, the fact that the post comes along and says again a second time, Hatar tells us that even the minimum level of tahar will be enough to make this koyen eligible to do the to do the service okay which means to say as long as he's been to the mikvah even if he hasn't waited until the night nevertheless he's ritually pure enough to make to sprinkle the ashes to right to prepare the ashes to sprinkle the ashes the tzidukim right? The Sadducees, they came along and said, the Pesach says richly, richly pure, which means he has to be completely pure, which means there has to be Harav Shemesh. He has, they have to wait until the nightfall, because if he didn't wait till the nightfall, then he's not complete, considered to be completely richly pure, and therefore it's, he's not eligible to do the service uh, with, the, with, the, with the ashes of the Parah Dumah. So now, in the time of the second Mesa Amikdosh, in order to be able to show that we specifically do not follow, that we do not follow the, um, the view of the Sadducees, they would take the people and the things that were going to be used for the Chatos, and they would purposely contaminate it with the Sheretz, uh, with you know something that that, that conveys uh, tuma, and then they would immerse it into the mikvah, and they specifically would not wait till nightfall to show that we're not following to show that we're not following the view of the tzedukim. Okay, yes, Ezra, Ezra, you have your hand up. Yeah. Yep. Um, question: The fact that it says ritually pure twice is that the indication that the person who does the sprinkling is now made tame and you have to bring somebody else who's a tahor to do the second sprinkling no what, what, what it what it means is like this since we've already said the first in the first pasuk that a richly clean person shall do it and then we refer back to him as hatahar the implication is that somewhere in between he has become impure and he's tahar even on the, the most uh, basic level, which is he's immersed into the mikvah. That's what it, it in other words, it's a ribui. It's coming to include that otherwise it could have just said, Vihiza alatame. Since you've already said in the previous verse that he was pure, just continue and say, and he will uh, sprinkle on the tame. Why mention again that he's tahar? Obviously, it means that even if he became Tommy and he just went to the mikvah, but he didn't have Harav Shemesh, he could still nevertheless sprinkle on the Tommy on the third day and on the seventh day. So that's what that's what it's coming to teach us. And we're going to see this um, now. I don't know if this is going to. Can you see that? Can you see what I've just shared over here? The Halachi Yudalid? 
Does everybody mm. see that? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So this this is um, from the laws of Para Aduma in chapter one of the Rambam, and the Rambam says spells it out. This now, although we're going to go back into the Gemara and see how we got there, but I'm going to the end first, give you the halacha in Rambam, because then following along inside will be a lot easier. Okay. So halacha fourteen says as follows: the Sadducees would say that the offering of the red heifer was acceptable only when those bringing it had waited until nightfall after immersion. Therefore, in the second temple, the court would cause the priests who burned the red heifer to become richly impure through contact with the carcass of a crawling animal or the like. He would immerse and then offer the red heifer to nullify the words of these brazen ones who issue rulings according to their whims without basis in the received tradition. Similarly, all of the containers into which the ashes of the red heifer were placed were all immersed that day. And what he's saying is that you didn't wait till nightfall um, in order to be able to use those containers. You could use those containers straight away. Now, this is the, this is the issue that we're going to be discussing uh, in the Gemara. For the same reason, a person who cuts the stalk of a reed to place the ashes of a red heifer upon it so that it can be placed in the water to consecrate it for sprinkling, should make it impure, immerse it, and then place, place the ashes in, in it. The one who cuts it and the one who immerses it must immerse themselves because that reed was considered, in other words, the rabbis made this special, um, I guess, category for the, for this particular uh, instrument, this, this, this container that they used out of this reed, that they considered it as an entity that came into contact with a corpse on the seventh day of its purification process. That's, what they, that's how they categorized it. They're saying we're mm -hmm. making it into a vessel that has come into contact with a corpse, but it's already after, but it's already after the seventh day. Uh, the, the, the sprinkling of the seventh day, and all that's left over is for going into the mikvah. Therefore, it does not need to have the ashes of the red heifer sprinkled on it. Instead, it is made pure to show, uh, instead, it is made impure, excuse me, it's made impure to show the Sadducees that the oral tradition should be upheld. It is then immersed, and the, ash, the ashes of the red heifer are placed in it. So that is uh, the halacha of the Rambam, um, and we're going to see how this all plays out in the Gemara that we're learning. Okay? Any questions before we go on? Um, okay. Rabbi, so, yes? Well, uh, when they say a, a, a reed, they're actually meaning a reed, a small, thin... No, it, uh, it, it, it seems that, that it, was, it was some kind of um, a wooden thing that was made into a tube. Now I, I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure exactly the, the you know what it looks like when it grows. But what they what they what they would do is they would take they would take it and make it into some kind of wooden um, receptacle uh, like a tube, and they would um, after cutting it make it into some kind of vessel that you could uh, receive the ashes into it, and then. And then they mix it with the water and then sprinkle it. So um, I'm not sure. I haven't seen a picture of it, but but, but that's the way it's, it's described. Um, well, we'll see. We'll see over here. So what, what does it say? What does it say in the mission? Now here we, we we're yeah we're going to continue with the with the the Mishnah um, where Rabbi Loza is mentioned. It says over Isaac there. Was going, Isaac, Isaac was going to say something. Sorry, no, I was just going to say that bamboo is that type of tube. Oh, I don't know what it refers yeah, to. It, it that could be. be used to hold water and to spray with even. It doesn't have to be a very thin little leaf. They come an inch and a half thick even for schach. You can get right. was there bamboo was, was there bamboo in, in, in Israel? I don't know. This could be a form of bamboo. I'm just saying it's not unheard of to have big reeds that are cut to spray with right it seems it seems that, that what that, that's what it would it, it would be it, because otherwise it doesn't make sense 
practically how you would use it. So yeah, it'd be something like a bamboo. The Tzadam, who we've learned in the Mishnah, in the case of this reed, this like this tube that one would cut for putting the Chatos ashes in it, Rabbi Eliezer says, Yitpal Miyad, you immerse them. He immerses it immediately. Rabbi Yeshua, Aymer, Rabbi Yeshua says, Yitame v'achakach yitpal, that you first, you render it tame, meaning you take a sheret and you make it tame, and then you immerse it. So basically, Rabbi Yeshua and Rabbi Yeshua are not disagreeing that you have to first have it to become tame in order to show the, the tzedukim that we disagree with them and then put it into the mikvah. But it seems that according to Rabbi Yeshua, you can immerse it straight away, right? Without having to first make it tame. Now we're going to an, a, analyze what does that mean? Because aren't you trying to differentiate from the from the from the sedukim? So what does it mean to immerse it straight away? What about making it tummy? That's what the Gemara asked. But and we asked um, the chat chaman. When did you cut the two? Excuse me. The chat chaman who cut who cut the tube? If you're going to say that the chaver cut it, and so therefore he's careful with tumat tahara, and so therefore he's going to be tahar, and therefore the, the reed that he cuts is also going to be tahar, lamalitzvila. So then why would it need to go into immersion according to Rebbe Yeza, Right? Like, what's the point? It's not tummy. So rather you're going to say that what? It must be the amaret who cut it. And now... And now it makes sense according to Rebbe Leza, why you immerse it straight away. Because we assume the Amaretz is Tame, and he made the reed Tame, and so therefore you can just immerse it straight away. You don't have to do anything before immersing it. But But in this case, would Rabbi Yeshua say that you first have to take a sheret and make it tome and then immerse it? Why wouldn't he agree to Rabbi Eliezer that he was talking about an Amaharetz and the Amaharetz is anyway tome and so therefore you've got to take the tube and you've got to immerse it without having to first make it tome because it already is tome. Right? Mm-hmm. Because hot tome v'koi, it's already tome. So why would Rabbi Yeshua require to immerse it in, uh, to, to make it tome and then immerse it in the mikvah? So Rav Bashila said in the name of Rav Masna, in the name of Shmuel, that what? Actually, it was done by a Chavar. The Chavar cut it. Now, and he's, what we're worried, like we said in our case, we're worried about the spittle of an Amharet. And that's why you're going to have to immerse it. Frey the Gemara, like we asked in our case, the Nuffel Amos, when did the spittle come into contact and fall on this too? If you're going to say that it was before he cut it, it's not a vessel. And since it's not a vessel, therefore it didn't become tome. And then since it didn't become tome, so you don't need to immerse it. So it's going to be after he cut it. So if after, he, if, if it's after he cut it, like we said before in our case, Misa but the, the, the cover is going to be very careful and guard it from any Amar is coming into contact with it. So where do you have a situation where you're going to have to Immerse it because it became tummy. And for the Gemara, the truth is, it happened before you cut it. Okay? That's when it may have come into contact with the spittle of an Amoret. Now, perhaps we're concerned that at the time when the cover cuts it, the spittle is still moist. And since it's still moist, therefore it conveys to ma, and therefore it has to go into the mikvah. So now, So all is well with regards to Rabbi Yeshua. This is how there is a demonstration to negate the view of the tzedukim. Why? Because you come along and you take a sheretz, right? You take a sheretz and you contaminate, you contaminate it before you put it into the mikvah. 
right? What we saying? We're saying like this. Let's go back to our, our Mishnah for a minute. Our Mishnah said that there's a certain thing that we do, certain stringencies that we do by Kodesh that we don't do by Truma, okay? And what is that? That is that we need to immerse, we need to immerse the things of Kodesh, right, in to the mikvah because we're concerned about if some of uh, the spittle of the Amoretz uh, remaining moist and so on and so on. Fine. So now, if that's the case, in our Mishnah, we're saying that what? It doesn't require Harim Shemesh. If it doesn't require Harim Shemesh, right? So then how are you making a distinction between between this thing of the chatas of the ape of the pora aduma and everything else okay it seems that there's no that, that there's 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 no difference there's no difference between everything else and this chatas why because i'm not sure give me a second Let's let's let, 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 let's just continue for a minute. Let's just continue for a minute. So so we, we go on to say that what the Tadam we learned in a we learned in a Mishnah. Let's keep going for a minute. They would purposely make Tommy the Kayin that was going to burn the Paraduma to discredit the opinion of the of the Tzidukim. that they would say that the only people who could be used to do the service of the Pardama were the people who had waited till nightfall in order to be completely tohar. Now, according to Rabbi Yeshua, so we understand how by immersing this 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 reed, this tube, right before you before using it, is going to repudiate the view of the tzedukim. Why? Because you first take a sheritz according to Rabbi Shua, and then you immerse it, right? But but according to Rabbi Yezah, who says that you don't deliberately contaminate with the sheritz, but rather it is immersed because of the concern that we had about the completed vessels right need to be in a stand even if they're done in the state of tahara nevertheless they need to be immersed in the mikvah but how does that repudiate the view the view of the tzidukim if you would say then in all other cases right in all other cases our view the view of the chachamim the view of the orthodox tradition right is that in every other case when you immerse it into the mikvah, it still needs to wait for Harim Shemesh. I know the Iker Kerel Tzedukim. So we would understand why <clears throat> when Rebbe Leza says that you put it into the mikvah straight away, even though you wouldn't, you didn't, you weren't metare, you were not metame it with the sheretz. Nevertheless, you, you, the, nevertheless, there's still a distinction between this case and all other cases to this, to discredit um, the view of the tzedukim. Why? Because in all other cases, putting it into a mikvah would not be enough. You'd have to wait until the night would fall, the night would come. But, but in the case of the chatos, we're not going to wait for night to come, right? If that is, if that's the case, right? Then what's going to happen is that our Mishnah, which implies that usually you don't have to wait until the night doesn't go in accordance with the Rebbe Liesa. It's a bit, <laughs> it's a bit, uh, um, it's a bit of a long argument, a long-winded argument, but, uh, but, but uh, that, that's the argument. But if you're going to say that according to Rebbe Liesa, Ordinarily, we do not require to wait for nightfall by by Let's look in Then, what demonstration are you making to negate the views of the Sadducees? And therefore, we seem to have proved over here that our Mishnah 
does not accord with the view of Rebbe Eliezer because it seems that Rebbe Eliezer would have to say that normally you have to wait for the night. And it's only in this case you don't have to wait for the night. So our Mishnah doesn't seem to fit with Rebbe Eliezer. Everybody following? Is anybody following? <laughs> again, let's, let, 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 let's, go, let's go through this again slowly. We said in our case that all vessels that are going to be completed by a, by in the state of Tahara, they need to be immersed in the mikvah. We assume from that that because it only says it needs to be immersed in the mikvah, therefore that's the only thing required. And you do not have to wait for night. If that's the case, it doesn't. This opinion doesn't seem to accord with Rebbe Liezer. Why? So here's the long-winded proof. Rebbe Liezer says that. When they cut the reed, although everything, we, he agrees that everything has to be made tame, right? In order to make a distinction between the Sadducees and our view. So he says that once you cut the reed, you immerse it straight into the mikvah. Rabbi Shua says, no, you have to first contaminate it with the sherets. But then according to Rabbi Yeza, our question is, one second, what kind of distinction is there between your immersing, right? You're immersing into the mikvah right now and the view of the Tzedukim, because as far as you're concerned, and as far as the Tzedukim are going to be concerned, right, this reed never had to have a heart of Shemesh to begin with. In other words, when are we going to make a distinction between us and the Tzedukim? When people agree, when people agree that it ordinarily needs a Har Shemesh. But if something in the first instance doesn't even need Har Shemesh, why? Because that's the rule with regards to this particular utensil and the kind of way it came into contact with anything that was Tomei or the suspicion that we had that it could come into, if that would never require for any other case to go to wait until the nightfall, then in this case, in what way are you making a distinction between your view and the, the view of the Tzedukim? So rather, you have to say that according to Rebbe Liezer, he would hold that in all other cases, meaning everything besides Paraduma, if this reed were to come into contact with the spittle of, of, the, of the Amharets, right, or, or the suspicion we have that it could come into, it would only require a mikvah and it would never, uh, it would excuse me, it would require a mikvah and also require Harif Shemesh, not like our Mishnah. That's the proof that our Mishnah would not go in accordance with Rebbe Liazza. So far, so good? Okay. I hope so. I hope everybody understands. Amara, so Rav answers that the truth is we can even accord our Mishnah with Rebbe Liazza. How? How are you going to do that? So he says, because the Chachamim were the ones who established that this particular reed should be as if a Sheretz touched it. Asuha kibtame kitme Sheretz. According to Rebbe you could say that the rabbis made it that the tube that was cut by the, uh, by, by the Paraduma for the Paraduma had the equivalent Tumor of a sheretz contaminated object. And therefore, everybody would agree that it needs Harav Shemesh. And since it needs to have Harav Shemesh, and Rabbi Eliezer says you can put it into the mikvah straight away, right? It's no problem. It's no problem. In other words, as a result of making this extra um, stipulation that the Chachamim now make this too as if it had been uh, touched by a Sheretz, according to Rebbe Leza, therefore, that's why we don't require you to actually touch it with a Sheretz, because it's already considered as if it is contaminated, like something that was contaminated with a Sheretz. And in something that was contaminated by a Sheretz, everybody agrees that you normally need to have Harav Shemesh. However, in the case of Para Aduma, you don't need to have Harav Shemesh. And therefore, we can still accord our Mishnah with Rebbe Liezer. Why? Because everybody would agree that usually, including Rebbe Liezer, usually you don't need Harav Shemesh. Why in this case would you need Harav Shemesh? Because the rabbis made it as if it had become contaminated by a Sheretz. Okay. 
if that's the case, that this tube is now treated like a sheret, so now, <laughs> it's not, it shouldn't have the ability to contaminate a person. Why? Because when it comes to Tumah, we explained this before, um, when it comes to Tumah, the only thing that can, ta- can contaminate a person or Kalim, right, are things that are a Aviya uh, Voisa Tumah, something that had been in contact with a corpse, then it can make another person tummy. But if it came into contact with an avatoma, which means if this reed, if, if this reed, excuse me, came into contact with a sheretz, and in this case we're saying it's as if it came into contact with a sheretz, however, this reed doesn't have the power to pass on this tumma to a person. So Allah Matanya, so then, why? Has been taught in the Brysa, then why does it say that the one who cuts the two, right, or immerses it, requires immersion himself? And what we see from that, from this Brysa that we're just quoting over here, it says that what? That the guy who took this reed and either cut it or immersed it into the mikvah, he himself requires to go into the mikvah. But why? Why does he need immersion if you're saying that the only thing the rabbis um, asserted with regards to this read is that it's considered as if it had been touched by a sheretz. Something that's been touched by a sheretz doesn't pass on the tumor. <clears throat> so we've got a problem. So then how do you reconcile it? And the Gemara, the Ella, rather, asahu kitme mace. No. What they, the rabbis did is they took this, this reed, and they treated it like it had been contaminated by a corpse. Okay? If that's the case, then this reed, it's not enough to just put it in the mikvah. You need to give, sprinkle it on the third day, on the seventh day, like every other thing that requires the hazar, the sprinkling, in order to become tar from Tumas Mes. Right? So Allah Matanya said, then why does it so then why does it taught? Otherwise, in the Brisa where it says, it says that the one who cuts it or the one who immerses it only requires what? Immersing into the mikvah. Tvila in, when the Brisa says that it needs to have tvila, it means that only tvila, but hazos, shlishi, or shvi, loy. When it comes to the sprinkling of the third and the seventh, then it wouldn't be required. It's not required. So therefore, the Gemara has to revise it and say, no, you've got to really understand as follows. The Chachamim took this reed and they made it as if it were something that contracted Tumah, but it's all re- like the Tmemes of the, you know, the impurity of a corpse, but such an object that is already on its seventh day. And therefore, it's already after the sprinkling, so there's no sprinkling that's still required for this for this God, for this tube. All that's left is the immersion into the mikvah. And if you will remember what we did at the beginning of the class when we went when we went when we went through the Rambam, that's exactly what the Rambam says. The Rambam said that what we've done with this, what we've done with this um, read, is we've made it into something as if it had contaminated, been contaminated with a corpse, as if it's already on its seventh day, which is why it doesn't require any sprinkling of the third and the seventh. All it needs is immersing in the mikvah. Right, the Gemara, one second. We have a problem. We have this principle that's taught in a brisa that me'olam lechitshu dava b'parah. The, the rabbis, never innovated a matter of Tumah with regards to preparing the Paraduma. Even though we had the highest standards of Tahara were instituted for it, but nevertheless, they didn't make things up, okay? They didn't create things that don't exist anywhere else. Where do you have this idea of something that is considered to be to my mace? But doesn't have to have the sprinkling on the first, on the third day, and on the seventh day. 
and all that it needs is mikvah. It seems like you're making up a whole new category altogether. So how can you say that the cut tube is treated as if it's been contracted tumor from a corpse? Right? And, uh, and, 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 and it's after the seventh day. This would constitute a new, like the biggest chiddush, right? So the Gemara answers and says, Omar Abaya, Abaya says, Shaloi Omru Kardom Metame Moshe. When we say that they don't come up with any new idea, what we mean is as follows. We're not going to come along and take something which ordinarily is never going to contract Tuma and say that it's going to contract Tuma. That would be a Chidosh, right? In other words, when we take a, take like a, 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 a spade, right? A spade is something that no Zav ever uses as a chair to sit on, or it, it never puts its weight on the spade for it to become uh, Thomas, if, so for example, if a spade is on the floor and somebody who's a zav sits on the sits on the spade, we're going to say that that spade is not going to become tuma. Why? Because even for a chatos, even for this the the the, the ashes of the, of the paraduma. Why? Because that would be a chiddush. Because we say the only thing that can become a midras, that can become tummy from a zav, is something that is made for sitting on, right? Like a bed, a chair, a mat, and so on and so forth, or clothes, but not, but not a spade. That would be that would be considered a, 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 to be a complete, uh, complete innovation. Okay, the Tanya, as it was taught in Ebrisa, Ayoshivalakli. Anyone who sits upon a utensil, meaning if you sit upon a utensil on which a Zav had already sat, right, they have to immerse um, your garments and immerse themselves with the waters and remain tummy until evening. It would be possible to think that if a Zav turned over a saw container and sat on it, or if you turned over a tarkav, which is a container of two kav, and turned it over and sat on it, that what? You hate Tomei, that it should become Tomei, Talmud Leima, to dispel this notion, the Torah says, that one who sits upon a vessel upon which the Zav sits will become Tomei. It doesn't say that he sat but it says that he sits. Why does the pastor come along, especially to tell me that he sits on it and not that he sat on it? Misha to teach us that it's referring to only a utensil that is used purposely, is set aside for sitting upon it. Yotza there, this comes to exclude then the uh, a, 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 this measuring container that, that is usually used just for measuring the how much. Um, how much you have in 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 the in this container? If you see a zav sitting on him, like why are you sitting on that? We need it now to do our work, and so you have to get off it. In other words, it's not made for it's not made for sitting on it. Therefore, such a vessel does not become tome. Similarly, when it comes to the spade that we just mentioned, which is not used for sitting on, it's also not susceptible to become tome as a seat of a zav. Now. When we say that the rabbis never innovated, that in regards to Pora and Duma, um, there would be a something that usually we would say it is not. That's what we're referring to. We don't make a, a vessel that is not used for sitting into something that would, for sitting, that, that, that would be used for sitting in order to make it tummy. That's what we don't do. But they could uh, treat a, a, a tube, right, that we're going to use uh, for the Asian, the the, the Afra, the Pora, to as if it is contracted tumor from a corpse, and the seventh and it's the seventh day after um, after Hazor. Why? Why is this okay? The reason why it's okay is because when we take the tube itself, right, put everything aside, the tube itself, right, because it's made into a receptacle, it could technically 
contract a level of humus mess if it came into contact with a mess, right? When we say the spade, the spade can never become tummy. Why? Because it's not it's not a vessel upon which you would sit or or, or, or rest on. That's not what it's made for. Whereas this reed, once you make it into a vessel, you could uh, it could come into contact with its mace, and then it would become uh, something that would require uh, hazah of seven, three, and seven, and then go into the mikvah because it could at some point come to contract contract this. Therefore, the Chachamim are not are within their uh, within their rights to come along and, for the sake of Parah Duma, add this extra stringency and say that we consider it to be like a Tmei Meis that's on the seventh day, and what it requires is a mikvah, and what comes out of all of this is that Rabbi Eliezer's opinion can still work with our Mishnah. Because as far as he's concerned, the reason why you immerse it straight into the mikvah without first contaminating it is because it's already to be considered to be to be mace, and that's why it can go straight into the mikvah. However, in our case, in our Mishnah Rebellion would agree that all it requires is immersing in the mikvah, and it doesn't require it doesn't require Haram Shemesh waiting for the night. Okay, and I, what about the tzedukim? The answer is, everybody knows, right? Everybody knows that the rabbis made this read to be considered to be like it's to mace, and nevertheless, they didn't require harav shemesh, which ordinarily, if something were contracted, uh, had con- uh, contracted to must mess, and was going to be immersed into the mikvah on the seventh day after Hazayah, it would still need harav shemesh. And that would not be the case when it comes to part of Duma. Okay, so far so good. Everybody still with me? Any questions? Okay. <laughs> I told you you're in for a ride today. Okay, I, I did warn you. Okay, now the Gemara moves on to the seventh case. Seventh case listed in the Mishnah of stringencies with regards to Kodesh that we don't apply to Truma. It says, Okay, what does this mean? We said that a vessel, right, combines everything that's in it with regards to Kodesh, but not with regards to Truma. In other words, generally speaking, right, if something comes into contact with a uh, a Rishon Tuma, then it becomes Tomei, but the other foods in the same vessel, right, do not um, contract Tuma from the original piece, right? Why? Because they're separate pieces, right? And here we're saying with regards to Kodesh, the vessel itself combines them all so that if one piece contracts Tuma, all the pieces contract Tuma. How do you know this? Where do you learn this law? From where do you derive this idea that this vessel combines all of the foods with regards to Kodesh and makes it one and makes it all Tommy? Amar Rav Khanin says, because it says in the Pasuk, it says, one gold ladle of ten shekels filled with incense. Now, since it says kaf achas, and the word af achas is extra, you could have said kaf asarazov, a ladle of asarazov, but you didn't just say kaf, you said kaf achas, so therefore, because of soul, call kaf achas. We learn from this that the Torah makes everything that's in the ladle in like one entity, and because you have that with regards to this particular case with the Ketores. So therefore, from here, we learn out that we're going to make a special stringency for the case of Kodesh, that if one thing in the vessel became Tomei, we're going to consider everything in the vessel to become Tomei because it's one vessel. 
Yeah. So, Frank the Gemara, ask the Gemara, Mosin Rabkana. Rabkana challenged this, right? From the Mishnah. It says in the Mishnah, Hoisiv Rabakiva, Hasoilis, Vakatoiris, Vahalavoina, Vagicholim. Rabakiva added the fine flour of Goydish, the incense, the fragments, and the coals as being subject to the rule that what? She nogat full yoim, the mixosai, possibles kulai, that if a full yoim touched part of it, he is rendered unfit all of it. Now, what did we say Tful Yom is? Tful Yom, we said, is somebody who has gone to the mikvah, so he's tar, but he still has some tumor, uh, right? Because he hasn't waited until the night. Now, we say in regards to this Kodesh, right? These are the fl- the flower and the incense and the frankincense and the coals of something that was being brought up in the base of Midrash, so it's Kodesh, that if Tful Yom touched part of it, he renders all of it unfit. Uh, now, this testimony of Rabbi Kiva is only going to be what? On a rabbinic level, right? In other words, not there. Mimai, from where do we see this? From where do we see that? What Rabbi Kiva is trying to apply to everything inside the vessel is going to be only on a rabbinic level and not on a biblical level. Midik Tani Reisha, we see this from the first part of the Mishnah. What does it say over there? Hey, in the Rabbi Shimon Ben Masera, Rabbi Shimon Ben Masera testified, regarding the Chatos ashes, that if a Tomei, uh, if a Tomei, someone who's Tomei, touched Part of it, Shetime is Kuloi, he rendered Tame all of it. Now, the testimony of Rabbi Shimon Ben Maseira, that all of the pieces of the Khatas ashes within a vessel are considered as one, that is definitely a decree of the Chachamim. And what is the expression, the language of the Mishnah? The language of the Mishnah is Bukotani, and the Mishnah says, Place of Rabbi Kiva, Rabbi Kiva added. So if we say he's added, he's, he added, he added to who? He added to that which Rabbi Shimon ben Maseira said. And that which, that which Rabbi Shimon ben Maseira said, that which Rabbi Shimon ben Maseira said was certainly the Rabbanon. Because the rule that a vessel combines all the pieces of the Khatas and gives them um, the status of one piece can't be um, biblical, can't be there, right? So why? Because the chatos was not brought in the base of Mikdash. The para aduma was brought outside of the base of Mikdash. And the positive that Rebbe brought was only for things that are going to be on, on the altar. So this idea of combining them all together could not be from the verse that Rebbe Hanin brought because that's only with things that are within the base of Mikdash. The Paradumu was done outside of the base of Mikdash. And so therefore, that verse couldn't apply. So therefore, it must be that when Rebbe Shimon ben Beseira came along and said that all the contents of the one vessel that has all the ashes, that they all become Tomei, that's got to be on a rabbinic level. And so if Rabbi Akiva came along and said, I'm adding to that, to say that the flower and the incense, etc., right, all become tame, it also has to be the Rabbanon. So therefore, we have a problem. Rabbanon is trying to say that what? That this idea stems from a biblical verse, a biblical source that everything becomes, that everything can become can become uh, tame. Once you touch one part, all of it becomes tame. But it seems from this Mishnah that we just quoted that it's not, it's not biblical. The huh? The Rabbanon. Yeah, so it's the Rabbanon. Amarish Lakish, Bishop Kapara. So Rish Lakish says in the name of Kapara, and here we go over to that of Dalin Ahmed Aleph, that Lainitzricha and Lashiara Mincha, this testimony of Rebbe Akiva, it was needed only for the five flower remainders of a Mincha offering, to which the biblical rule that a vessel combines this Kurdish contents does not apply. In other words, right? In other words, the mincha, the, the shi'ariya mincha, right? Which means the remainders of the offering, right? What's the rule with them? 
what's the rule with them? So we say, we say that on a biblical level, on a biblical level, the this idea of combining them all together wouldn't apply to the Shi Oriam and the remainders. Comes along Rebbe Kiva and adds a rabbinical um, addition to it uh, to say that it to say that it um, that is not uh, that 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 we still apply the same rule to to this to the Shi Oriam But the Raisa Torah Likli Hakli Mitzorfoy. Because biblically, that which requires a vessel, the vessel combines it into one entity. But that which does not require a vessel, uh, the vessel does not combine it into one entity. But also Rabbanan and Rabbis came, alay, came along with Gazru, and they decreed the Afal Gav, the Eni Tzorich Lekli, even if it does not require a vessel, Kli Mitzarfoy, nevertheless, the vessel combines it into one entity, which means as follows. It's true that when it comes to our decree, where we're saying that everything in Kodesh, right, everything in Kodesh, if it's in one vessel, it becomes, um, it all becomes Tomei. If one piece became Tomei, everything else became Tomei. We're talking about, it seems, right, this is my understanding of it, we're talking about in a case where you, it's no longer on the Mizbeach, right? <laughs> We're talking about uh, you get a prime cut, right? Prime cut, prime, prime cut rib, and uh, you know all these pieces have already been uh, offered up on the on, onto the Mizbeach, and now you're taking it down, and you, you cut it, you you know you split it up, etc., and so on. And now, but the food itself is Kodesh. Now, this food, if it becomes tummy, you're not allowed to eat it. So the question is, if one piece became Tame, and there are other pieces in the same vessel, even though they don't need to be in the same vessel, right? They're not now being brought up onto the Mizbeah, so they don't need to be in the same vessel, but they happen to be in the same vessel, so biblically, it's true. They um, they don't need to be in a vessel. Hamim nevertheless came along and said, but if they are in the same vessel, then we're going to apply this same rule that we would apply to it if it were in a vessel, going up onto the Mizbeach, right? And we say that all of it becomes Tomei. And that's the stringency that we say by Kodesh, that we don't say by Truma. I think we'll uh, we'll stop here for today. And... Uh, uh, Rabbi, and, a question. Yes. You know, if if something is within the same vessel and one piece becomes Tomei, why wouldn't the others be declared Tomei? Since well, they're all inside the same vessel. That's and what they we're saying. probably are in touch with each with each other. No, we're not saying that they were in touch with each other. We're saying because they are in the same vessel, the vessel, the vessel itself makes it into one entity. In other words, that even though they're separate, the tailly makes them one. Not practically, but theoretically. Because in other words, practically, they, they, they may not be touching. You could have a massive pan. Right, but, but but theoretically, because they're in one vessel, so because we learn it out from Alf Achas, right? It's one ladle. That one ladle, because it used the word extra word Achas, we come along and we say that it makes everything inside of it to be one entity. That's why we make it. Today. My 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 question would be, if it if it's in the same pan and it touches the pan. The pan now becomes tummy because of because of uh, connection to the tummy piece, and anything that comes in that's in that pan, that's in contact with the pan itself, also becomes tummy. So we 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 mentioned this before that this um, is not true when it comes to something that contracted. A tumor from a from an ava tumor. When you contract tumor from an ava tumor, which means if a sheretz touched you, right, or the sheretz touched a piece of meat, that can no longer um, pass on this tumor to and to 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 another vessel. It doesn't pass on because the only thing that can make a vessel tummy is the sheretz itself. Mm. Excuse me, yeah. excuse me, not the sheretz itself. Yeah, the sheritz itself. That's correct. The sheritz itself can make it tummy. But, but something that was touched by a sheritz 
cannot pass it on to something else. So therefore, what we have to say is that they all become combined into one entity. So one piece of meat and all of the pieces of meat in, meat are considered to be all combined together. And so just like this one piece of meat is, is, is considered Tommy, all of them are considered to be uh, Tommy because they're all one entity, which is an extra stringency. We make by Kodesh that we don't make by anything else. So I, I stepped away from the from the shear for a few minutes. That's the reason why I didn't catch that part. No problem. No problem. No problem. It, this, was, this was, this was um, in connection to the reed. We said this. In connection to the reed, when we said that the person who was cutting the reed and the person who was immersing the reed has to has to immerse in, um, has to immerse into the mikvah. So we asked, why does he have to immerse into the mikvah if, if we're just considering him to have been touched by a sheretz? Because if it's just if if this reed is considered to be something that was touched by a sheretz, it cannot pass it on to a person or to a keli. So that's why we had to re revise it, and we had to say that it was actually considered by the Chachamim to be to Meimes, and on the seventh day, in order that it should be, it should be able to pass on the tuma to the person who was cutting it and immersing it, therefore requiring them to go into the mikvah as well. Okay. Got it. Thank you. I, uh, All right. Zagazot. Great start to the week. Thank you. <laughs> That's <laughs> <laughs>